I want to invite you into a wild thought experiment. Imagine that in one year, it will all stop. In precisely 365 days, society will come to a halt. No more buyers, no more sellers, no producers, no consumers, no masters, no servants, no landlords, no tenants, no entrepreneurs, no politicians, no more governments, no more markets, no more nothing. Imagine society gone and all of us frozen in social time, suspended between the past and the future. The big societal time is up. At that point, love to come to an agreement on how to organize the way we provide for ourselves. What is the good life, and how should we go about pursuing it? There will be nothing short of the total redesign of the rules of the game. But how to prepare ourselves for such a daunting task? This is precisely what I want to talk about today. And this talk starts with the terrifying claim. The future has been cancelled. I say this both figuratively and literally. On the one hand, it seems we have lost our collective capacity to imagine life outside of the present. And on the other, we are literally cancelling potential futures by destroying the fabric of life on Earth. So let me start with the first aspect. We have become prisoners of the present. The Zapatista call it the domination of the perpetual present. The perception of the present as the horizon of all possibilities. It's this feeling you get when everything you try to imagine about the future is only a slight variation of what already exists. Example. Imagine the world in the year 2220. What could it be? Flying trains and capitalism? Teleportation? And capitalism, brain transplant maybe, and capitalism, global minimum wage, and capitalism. I think you see my point. Today, mortality, artificial intelligence, and the colonization of Mars are more plausible than moving beyond capitalism. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of one specific social world. Apocalypse, possible. Revolution, unthinkable. And this is that time. So now, usually this will be the moment where I show you a bunch of cool graphs and numbers of the environmental breakdown, where we all like, wow, this is bad. But I'm kind of lazy tonight, and I don't feel like doing this. I think you're gonna have plenty of this during the semester anyway. So I'll just use the internet. Um, Siri, search for Global warming, collapsing fisheries, deforestation, eroding soils, maltreatment of non humans, groundwater contamination, dry wells, air pollution, eutrophication, water sanitization, acidic deposition, stratospheric ozone loss, sea level rise, melting of ice caps, toxic chemical waste, biodiversity loss, social acidification, resource depletion, antibiotic resistance, certification in their waste. <laughs> Do not panic, it's okay, it's fine. Let's just search for something else. To relax, take this in, kittens, something cute. Wait, I've got, I've got it. Siri, search for forced migration, mass unemployment, widening inequality, persistent racism and sexism, rising xenophobia, obesity, hunger, destitution, slavery, drug and alcohol abuse, stress and depression, erratic financial markets, violent conflict. Now, you take these two lists, you put them in the back, you check what you get is to this situation. A perfect moral storm. Not only ecological, economic, social, or cultural, but all of these at once. Look at us. Humanity becoming a shaping force of the earth. The Anthropocene, they call it. We are all on the same boat, right? We only have one planet. We, us, humankind, or good old species. I don't know if you buy that story, but I don't. This we story is at best misleading, at worst deceiving. Think about it. 
the bottom half of the world population owns less than 1% of global wealth. The richest decide owns 85% of it. The poorest 3.5 billion people owns only 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions, while the richest 10% generate half of them. My point, this is not a we problem. It is the collateral damage of the grotesque lifestyle of a handful of Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic weirdos. But knowing who is doing it is not telling us why and how they're doing it. The, the million dollar question that I guess many of you will try to answer this semester and perhaps the many semester after that is, why is that? What is the source of this perfect moral storm? Is it extractivism or productivism, capitalism or consumerism, workism or neoliberalism? Exploitation or commodification, alienation or financialization, marketization or globalization. Reptilians? Nobody? Sorry. <laughs> Rebations to no purpose money, the malicious spirit of modernity, a ferocious dog eat dog economy, or just a furious fetish for GDP. You pick. I already have mine. The central assumption underlying all my research is that the economy is the beating heart of this multifaceted storm. And this is the claim I'm presenting before you tonight. As an introduction into that insight, imagine that you have 24 hours to deteriorate nature as much as you can. Except you cannot buy anything, or you cannot even use anything that you have bought in the past. What could you do in 24 hours? Breathe out CO2? <laughs> Relieve yourself in a water stream? <gasps> Rip up some seedlings or wring the neck of some rare bird you somehow managed to catch with your bare hands? In the end, not much. Not much. If I give you money, however, the damage will get real. You could fly to Tokyo and spurt a few tons of CO2 equivalent into the stratosphere, or shop for a computer and emit a good ton more everywhere will sign this life cycle. You could buy a cistern of glyphosate and pay people to discharge it into the wild. You could invest all your savings into oil drilling project in the Arctic Sea, or purchase the right to shoot a rhino. Or, my point, with purchasing power, comes pulverizing power. And here's the catch. You could do all that and even be praised for it. I could fly to Tokyo to speak about sustainability and be praised for my effort in raising awareness. I could acquire a new computer to launch a social cool startup to respectfully earn a living. My glyphosate will still will be pardoned for its positive impact on employment. My investment would reproduce a return that I could use to set my own wind farm. And my shop rhino, praised for bringing money into Namibian local conservation projects. I buy, I break, and this seems to be all fine. The tragedy of economy is that with great purchasing power comes no great responsibility. Official finding for my thesis. Reality is not like a Spider-Man film. This is when the economy becomes an excuse. If I do not fly, someone else will. Excuse. I need to attend that conference to find a job. Excuse. Hmm, I didn't even know my settings were invested in distracted projects. It's just a business. Excuse. I did not put a price on the rider's head. I just paid for it. Excuse. Behind all social and ecological injustices, there is someone that is just doing their job, or something whose impact is just a drop in the sea. First, I'm not blaming you. I fly around and shoot rhinos all the time, too. <laughs> but, again, I, it, but it doesn't matter here. My claim is that exploitation is a structural property of the current economic system. Somehow, certain economic ideas and institutions come to legitimize practices that are utterly 
stupid. Now, I'm a doctor, you've heard, I'm a serious scholar. I'm not going to just throw around words like this without checking their definitions, so I've done my own work. From the Latin stupere, to be amazed or stunned. So now imagine an anthropologist from Mars, actually from Earth, you know, that sees a select minority of humanity over consuming at the expense of everybody else, including themselves, in the long term. It shows a great lack of intelligence or common sense, a great lack of intelligence or common sense, which is the definition the Oxford Dictionary gives for the word stupid. One could say, time to wake up, but this would be a catch-22. To wake up, one must be dreaming. But we have lost the ability to do precisely that. Remember my point about the future being cancelled. We are stuck in reality. As decision makers, to imagine an economy without money, they can't. Without private property, they can't. Without wage labor, they can't. They'll tell you to be realistic. Realistic. I really hate that word. Realistic. I say sometimes this, you know, this food is not going to work. You should learn to consume less. At least waiting to have greener technologies. Oh, come on, Tim. Irrealistic, I say. I say, I've noticed that in between 1985 and 2009, the net monetary flow in between North and South has been of six, $666 billion from poor to rich countries. Maybe we should, should change that? Perhaps can some part of the debt to poor countries? Come on, to be realistic. I say in 2016 in France there was 5 million people living in poverty, which is 9% more than in 2006, the decade before. Perhaps we should share more, like adding an extra tax on income, not a million or something like this? They say be realistic. And shut up. Truth is, reality sucks for most people in the world. And I'm not even talking with the nature around them. Every time you hear the word realistic, think power. What is realistic is framed by a specific social context, a status quo often defended by those who benefit from it. Every time you hear the word, that's how it works, think power. Nothing works on its own and society is not an abstract system. Behind every rule, there are people. Behind all people, there are interests, wants, preferences, passions. An inflation target, an interest rate on a loan, debt to GDP ratio, an employment contract, health insurance, resource ownership rules, the price of a cup of coffee. Everything that has been socially constructed can be socially deconstructed. Every time you hear the word impossible, you need to think power. Every revolution, by definition, was impossible before it happened. Revolutionaries live in the realm of the unimaginable. They think and act as if something impossible was possible, and through struggle, they create the condition of its visibility. So we're not going to wake up and be realistic. We're going to dream up and be utopian instead. Let's stop trying to predict future of the economy and start inventing the economy of the future. That, that did not even take 20 minutes and we already solved all problems. I think we can just you know, call it a good day, go home. Everything's fixed. Good job, everyone. Thanks. I'm kidding. Of course, there's a catch. Always catch. The catch is that we, university students, the bright minds of tomorrow, we are also losing our ability to imagine. My feeling is that there is something wrong going on at university. I'm going to come clean. I first wanted to title the lecture Burn, University Burn. But I thought it was a bit pessimistic for our opening to the semester. So <laughs> restrained. And besides, it's, it's, you know, it's difficult to pinpoint what the problem is, really. But um, maybe we can find it out together. So, I can start from what I know, sharing my experience studying economics in France and Sweden, 
can call this participant self ethnography. I can just call it therapy. Perhaps it's, it's more precise. Maybe this was make with you, maybe not. So, so let's see. Okay. This. This is sensitive. Like many of you, I've been the victim of pedagogical abuse. I remember long, very long lectures. Two, three, four hours. Lectures with teachers so pompous and a voice so monotonous. It makes the Google Translate voice thriller. I remember PowerPoint slides with so much stuff that could be printed straight as books. Color, color and shape as aesthetically pleasing as a punch in the face. I remember taking so many multiple choice questionnaires that made my life feel like a never ending episode of Wants to be a Millionaire. I remember credits, loads of credits. Credits for this, credits for that. No credits for this, no credits for that. This is not the university, this is the Las Vegas of learning. And more than anything, I remember orders, orders, loads of orders and rules. Read this, read that, don't read this, and there's marks written on it. Do not write too much, do not write too little. Don't write with active sentences, don't write with personal pronouns, don't write without references. Respect deadlines. Memorize this. Um, yeah, yeah, memorize this because um, because I say so, because it's like this, because that's how it works. Come on, be realistic. I remember theories so ridiculous that sounds like a multi party sketch. Efficient market hypothesis, so wait for that one. The market knows everything, even the future. Okay. Trickle down, give money to the rich, they'll give it to the poor. The environmental cuts the curve. Don't worry about pollution, it can be growth always cleaned after itself. This is what we do in economics, by the way. The marginal revenue productivity theory of wages. This is my favorite. Your income is an indicator of how useful you are to society. This is not science, this is comedy. You have to study economics for five years, and then you have to unstudy it for another five years. Pardon the efficient strategy in Congress would say. I remember never discussing with my classmates. I remember never challenging the authority of my professors, even when I thought they were wrong. I remember being afraid to speak in front of the class. I remember being afraid to write any of my own ideas. I felt stupid, incompetent, and inappropriate, stuck in a system designed to force people information. This is not education. This is programming. But we students are not USB sticks. We are here to learn about the world, and it is in order to make it a better place. That learning starts from ourselves, from our questions, our worries, our passions. I remember starting my PhD and being told by an old white bull professor, Tim, you're going to build a global macroeconomic model to forecast resource scarcity. So now, between you and me, there's no point in doing this. And that's what I felt deep down in my gut. Not only is it impossible, but it's also useless. Argue against it. I said there's no more need for models telling us one thing we already know since the 70s that there can be no infinite growth on the finite planet. A few economics professors might still want to demonstrate that this is true. Most people do not. So I said, no, I want to do something else. And I'll never forget what the professor told me. Okay. He said something like this. Listen to him. You have to play by the rules. Get yourself a PhD first in respectful economics. Keep quiet for a while, and then you have more power to change things, you see? Then you can do your stuff, that's how it works. Don't be an entity. This story is bullshit. So we have to be realistic and follow how it works. As bachelor students, we need to be master students. As master students, we need to be PhD students. As PhD students, we need to be postdocs. As postdocs, we need to be lecturers. As lecturers, we need to be professors. And as professors, we need to be in a world of politics. Nonsense. The truth is that there will always be rules and hierarchy, and breaking them is never 
We went to the East. This story play by the rules now changed and later is not only bullshit, it actively stands against change. This is the story of us being socialized into doing something that feels wrong. I was very late in realizing it. I was already a master's student, waiting to be a PhD student. But people were starting to wake up before that. You get the Fridays for Futures movement. So now I, I really admire Greta Thunberg. When I grow up, I hope to be like her. When I look at Greta, I remember a story from Manfred Maxneef, one of my favorite economists. He passed away last summer. And so Manfred is, is Chilean and was doing his PhD work somewhere in Chile. And he tells the story himself. And he was walking in the streets and there's this poor man coming to him. Yeah, I'm poor, not anything to eat, I'm hungry, help me. And at this point, Manfred realizes that he's been trained in one of the best universities in the world for about 10 years, studying economics, supposedly equipping himself to solve the issue of poverty. He said, there's not a single thing I can tell this man that will help him. Not a single thing. Everything I've been doing for those 10 years is utterly useless and irrelevant to him. I really like this story. And since I've read it during my master's, Studies always stuck with me. I think they should make a sport. And, and I think they should stay in the back of our minds. And every time we read a book which we feel is useless, every time we're sitting through a lecture which we think is boring or irrelevant, except now, it <laughs> just stop and do something else. Let's just walk out and do something else. And I believe at this time, we, collectively, and on a massive scale, just stop and do something else. So now, I was told we were having a break at some point. And right now, maybe we are. Ten minute break. Okay, back at the five past.
have been arguing that the economy is ruining the world for a few times. And then my second claim was transitioning to show how there was a problem with how we teach at university, which I argued based on my experience. And now I need to reconnect on that thing we feel as students where the problem is. And I want to propose perhaps not a solution but a way forward. The question is, what should we be striving for as students? And my answer to this is autonomy. So now I want to share one concept that changed me as a student, one little word I've read about that empowered me to dare go against the system at university and outside of it. And this is the concept of autonomy from a great French philosopher, Cornelius Castoriadis. Um, to understand autonomy, one must start by understanding its opposite, alienation. So, oh, alienation, okay, we're, so, oh, Castoriadis doesn't speak of alienation, he speaks of autonomy versus heteronomy. But let us start with alienation, because I think it's a word that we connect to more easily. You become alienated from something when you experience the distancing from that thing. All of a sudden, something you thought was family <coughs> becomes strange or alien. And of course, this alienation does not appear magically. It is the product of power relation in between people. I'll give you an example. I, I don't fly for environmental reasons anymore. But when I was accepted into the PhD, on the first day, walking into the university, being given, here your badge, here's your key, and here's your ticket to Eureka. Good morning. What is this? And I'm like, oh, that's sorry, I'm fly. Went to Eureka, they came Paris. It's a bit of a hassle, you took the ferry for a couple of days. They're like, they were very good. They said, okay. If you don't attend this meeting, we take candidate number two. That was a bit of a strange situation. Welcome to the French university system. It sounds very strange to go here. Yeah. But I, I think this is, I did take the plane. And I felt terrible about it. This is, this is what alienation is. You do something because you have, because let's say you're put in a situation where you see no other options, but you feel that this is wrong, but you do it nonetheless. So you feel divided about this is this is the experience of alienation. So precisely the situation where one is illegitimate or unjustly controlled to think and act in a specific manner by someone or something else with more power. In the case, people with the selection for the PhD. So it's the situation where you lack autonomy in comparison to others around you. And to lack the autonomy means to be disconnected from your agency. So that's a situation where you're the passenger of an alien wheel, not driving, but being driven. You do things, but you don't really know why you're doing them. Or you know why you're doing them, and that's not what you have said the reasons for. So you could say it's a lack of authorship over the one's life. For the hungry, autonomy is the difference between starving, so I would eat, if I could, and fasting, I've willingly decided not to eat. And for us, it's the difference between imposed schooling, I would do something else if I could, and not be here, and deliberate study, I've willingly decided to be here. Italian Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci calls this form of domination hegemony. Okay, so an institution is hegemonic, if he promotes a common sense that sets the particular worldview of one group as the universal horizon of an entire society. So for example, as a university student, I have the impression that I can choose to study whatever I want, right? But that's not really a free choice, because I'm constrained in a number of options by certain moral rules, except the diploma and torture techniques. My future ability to secure a well-paid job, except the diploma and transcendental philosophy or by specific definitions of what constitutes knowledge within the society.
society had been in, except the diploma and the rules are changed. It's not changed. So even though I am free to choose, my autonomy is already constrained by the outside. These are funny examples, but here's a real one. And that's a personal story. Uh, it was at the end of high school, you know, when you have to choose what college, what university, so you go to high school, study, counselor, and then I don't know if I can do that, but just like, okay, we'll do some questions, I'll be sure you. And I, was, I, I didn't remember this, now when I think about it, it's kind of odd. So I was asking my brother, it still exists. My brother is last year of high school. So they go and they rank all disciplines you could study at university based on expected average earnings per year. So they show you, of course, like, well, engineering, this money, you study geography, this money, you study like medieval poetry, it's not even on the list. <laughs> so, and I find this quite alienating. You're curious, engaged mind, passionate about a million different things, and then all of that is reduced to one single military here. I wanted to be a sharp biologist, but that wasn't reality. So I became a scientist. So whether we call it alienation, hegemony, or heteronomy, you get the point. That's a situation where you swallow whatever rule is around without questioning. And this captures the feeling I've had about university rules. Rules you follow and you don't question. A perfect preparation for a good life. Again, a situation with rules you follow and you don't question. So what does Castoriadis say to that? He says, and I'm greatly shortening the argument, fuck autonomy. Let us reclaim our autonomy. But what is autonomy? What is autonomy? First, autonomy is not an end state, but a never-ending process of critical engagement. It is the active attitude of someone, and I quote, from Castoriadis, who's capable of uncovering fantasies as fantasy and who finally never allows them to rule unless he or she is so willing. The way I see it is that the mark of eternity is, it, is an I don't know answer to the why question. If I do not know why I study economics, this is a source of eternity. It comes from outside. And again, the second why. If I do not know why I want to earn a lot of money, that's a potential answer to the question. Economics, then this is again a source of patronum. It comes from outside. The Socratic process of why questioning is the essence of what it means to be autonomous. And now I turn to power. So, this critical engagement, critical thinking, means the systematic questioning of authority. For me, that derives. This is a logical conclusion. Let me quote Castorius again on this. Quote, setting one's own rules means the rejection of authority, not even the authority of one's own task thought. Autonomy, autonomous thinking is unlimited, unstoppable questioning that is constantly self-critical. And of course. So the goal of that process of questioning is self-institution. Self-institution starts with the rejection of everything that is institutionalized. Remember when I was talking about those things that were socially constructed, that could be socially constructed? You could call them institutions. Those are the rules I'm talking about. So in the same way that the hatchling was stared through its eggs to come to exist, the autonomous person must first refuse all beliefs before being able to choose which ones should be opposed, which ones should remain, and which ones should be created. This is the famous uh, May 68, graffiti, May 68, 1968, was a famous revolt in France. Obedience begins with consciousness. Consciousness begins with disobedience. So now my proposal is to actually add this, to replace our famous motto that we have on this building that you may have seen, carved in beautiful golden letters that say, to think fully is great, but to think rightly is great. I think perhaps this statement has had its life. Of course, self institution is not chaos, it's not the rejection of all rules, you know, some form of anarchy. No, no, no. The right of rejecting rules that one finds unfair comes with the duty to respect rules one agree with. Example, let's say you refuse the rule that PhD thesis should be limited to 300 pages. 
I agree with you. This is a stupid You said that the thesis should be as long as it needs in order to adequately answer the research question. But that's just another rule. The thing is, you cannot reject old rules forever. At some point, you need to commit to them. Let's say it like this autonomy is a voluntary obedience to rules one has consciously chosen. But why am I telling you, why am I saying this now? How is that relevant to you? First, because I think the university has turned into a source of heteronomy, that's sorry, I should say. When it was supposed to be precisely the opposite, we hear a lot about how we're here to learn critical thinking. From my experience, I find that a lot of the courses that attended were actually doing the precise opposite. And second, because I think we can do something to change that. And actually, we're here with people that have been trying to change this for a while. Seamus. I'm not the best place, of course, to tell the story of Seamus, but it's really a story worth being told. So I'll do a short version, and maybe the, the elders later on can tell you more around the drink of the legends of Seamus. I'll do a short version. Once upon a time, like end of the 90s. In a faraway land, far, far and remote, two students at Uppsala University were unhappy. Unhappy about not being able to learn and discuss, but what they saw was the most crucial environmental development issues of their time. If nobody would do it, why don't we just do it ourselves? They thought. Maybe this is me imagining it. I was probably in Swedish. They took their pen and wrote a proposal to the university president. We want a course like this about that. Impressed he was. And he replied, Good idea, yes, it is. Yourself, the course you shall run. You and I used to preside at the University of the 90s. Don't trust the latest stars. And so they did. They called it humanity. And nature. The design topics invited the speakers to walk into the room. They let their passion and curiosity drive the show. Result? 400 students showed up. It worked. It worked very well. In 1995, Seamus was created following that simple design, empower students to become co creators of their education. Castorianists would say, give students autonomy. That's been working ever since. And today, right now, students continues to attract hordes of passionate students. You and I took my first Seamus course when I was an Erasmus student. Young, dumb, and full of crackpot economic theory. You can guess. I still remember sitting in the classroom with a Hippie looking guy asking me to share my opinion on the topic of the lecture. He said something like this Turn to your neighbor and share your thoughts. What the hell is going on, man? What is this? The sewing circle? The alcoholic anonymous? I was puzzled. I was like, what? Me? Thinking? Doing something? This bad guy. He's got it wrong. Education is you telling me stuff, not the other way around. Leave me alone. I did so, I expected, painfully. And after 10 minutes or so, here's KP course coordinator again, this time asking me directly, so Tim, what did you talk about? Want to share anything with us? Now I went from being puzzled to mortified. What is wrong with these people? So to say the least, attending to this course wasn't easy. I was scared, panicked, but in the end, I loved it. And it changed me. A few years later, I worked as a course coordinator at CMS, putting together the course I think every economist should receive the global economy, not the semester, sorry. Again, I loved it. I would give away my four university degrees for this few years I spent at CMS, seriously. And today, as I finished my PhD, 
Only now I think I truly realize the importance of its innocence to me. Then you realize something. You cannot change the world outside without changing the classrooms inside. Because in the end, what we want is not only a decent education. We want to live in a decent world. But I want to show that there are many autonomous forces we should fight against. The university is only the playground of evaluation. Universities do not directly wreck the planet, as sometimes surely have, but corporations, governments, and consumers do. Beyond the rules of university, there is an entire world to change. So now I want to share a little piece of my work on degrowth. How many of you have heard the word degrowth before? How many of you know what degrowth is? Okay, all right. For the others, here's the definition. Degrowth comes from the French, the French, croissants. <laughs> it's a concept that emerged in the 2000s in France, so as an alternative to sustainable development. And basically, that was a, two people, a marketing expert <clears throat> that with his, his marketing company and a comedian, that were very pissed off at the concept of sustainable development because they thought it was it was, uh, it was not really pinpointing to the problem, which was that we were just overburdening burdening the planet and we needed to reduce emissions, to reduce environmental pressure. So we should not call it sustainable development, we actually should call it sustainable degrowth. And so they created this, this slogan to criticize sustainable development. That was 2002. In 2008, it was translated in English from the croissant to degrowth, became an international movement, became a political party in France, Parti pour les Croissants, and it became a field of study. Uh, we now have international conferences every two years, and PhD students just like myself have been standing for four years. So let me give you one simple heuristic that I use in my thesis to think of deeper, that I think could help us to think of sustainability today. And that is this. Imagine degrowth as three dimensions. So first, don't imagine degrowth as a synonym for reduction. I know it sounds like it, but imagine degrowth, that you hear degrowth, capital D, the movement of degrowth. It's a paradigm, it's not only a thing. So, the first dimension is decline, degrowth off. You know this, this is the limits to growth from the 1970s, no infinite growth on a finite planet. Advocates of green growth argue that technological progress and structural change enable the decoupling of natural resources from economic growth. Degrowthers disagree, no infinite growth on a finite planet, that's it. And the only way to address the environmental crisis is for affluent classes your consumers to produce and consume less. So now, how many of you know what decoupling is? How many of you know the term green growth? Well, is there actually a different thing? <laughs> so you imagine like this green growth is the idea that we can continue to have economic growth while reducing environmental impact relies on the hypothesis of decoupling, which is basically the scientific hypothesis that at some point, economic growth, so rise in GDP will decouple. So right now it's like this, GDP of uh, environmental pressure is up, at some point it's going to decouple, we're still going to have economic growth, but environmental pressure is going to go down. A little more than this. This is decoupling. So now, I in order to speak about degrowth, we have to refute that hypothesis. And again, you can try to show that it's real. Uh, sharing findings from my work is that it's very difficult to do so, and no one has really managed, which is quite surprising because the company of degrowth has been the strategy of most international institutions in the last 20 years in terms of environmental policy. With a couple of colleagues last summer, we thought that's enough. We cannot have this 
Chimera of the company and forming a radical policy. This is where you can see Messi, the weapons monster on this. Because I'm arguing that this green growth is decoupling. Everybody talks about it, but nobody has an evidence of it. So, and so we are to look at every single study that was ever done in the world since the concept of decoupling exists in emerging humanities. And the result is that the decoupling literature is a haystack without the needle. Decoupling is an extraordinary claim without extraordinary evidence. There is no empirical evidence of absolute, permanent, global, large, and fast enough decoupling. So people tell me, yeah, yeah, but no, yeah, no, okay. Sometimes you have local relative decoupling, not this, but this. So this is not enough, as you can imagine, nature doesn't give like uh, brony pounds for just being relatively more efficient. Like, we want this to decrease absolute levels of, of emissions when it comes to climate change, for example. And when we have this absolute, sometimes not for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but for certain local pollutants or what, it is a very tiny, very local, most of the time, temporary couples, many different couples. Overall, if you look over the long term, in most places in the world, environmental pressures are going up and shows a steady correlation of G. And then people will tell you, of course, like it hasn't happened in the past, but uh, let me tell you what is going to happen in the future. And of course, as a utopian, Revolutionary like myself, I like it. I like everything more and more too. So, in the report, most of the report is demystifying, I would say falsifying, falsifying this theory. So, check the report if you want to see, basically offering seven reasons to show how decoupling is in theory impossible. Not only because it hasn't happened in the past, just because it cannot happen in the future either. To the degree, of course, where we need it to happen in order to address the so, in the end, it's a bet. And I tell you this because this is the, remember, the first dimension of the people is decline, the environmental issues. And if you admit the coupling is possible, then there's no need to keep growing. So, here at Degrowth, it's, it's a bit of a bet, let's say. Either we keep growing and hope that the coupling will happen, or we acknowledge that the coupling is impossible and start directly reducing the problematic forms of consumption and production. So, degrowth is the second option. That how we don't know it seems to be uncertain, this decoupling thing. So let's reduce the problematic form of production and consumption now and then we see. So that's the first dimension, that's the usual one degrowth. People know about degrowth, the less. But there are two other dimensions that are less well known and are more interesting. The second one is degrowth as emancipation, not degrowth of something, degrowth from something. And this Decroissance in French, when they created the concept, they think they were very funny and smart because it goes from décroyance in French, that means to unbelieve. So they're saying that degrowth is not only to decrease, it's to unbelieve in the ideology of growth. And they did so because they realized that the limits to growth discourse from the 70s did not work, did not convince. And the authors in 2002, when they created the concept of sustainable degrowth, they are pointing to this that we cannot say to people produce and consume less in a society that has defined its purpose as producing and consuming more. So, in order to actually reduce production and consumption, we need to unbelieve in this ideology of growth. So, that's you could say it's the second strategy. And besides, the environment is not the only problem. So I give you three examples. Um, very quickly, the first one is secular stagnation. That's a concept in economics, Marxian economics, and mainstream economics. And here's the mystery. When you look at average rates of GDP growth over time, over a long period of time, centuries, decades, they are just faltering. They're slowing down. They can be growth ever will be slowing down. Every country is in the same path. High growth is lower than the world. Low growth. So people have started to wonder that maybe they ventured and said that, that maybe economic growth is actually the exception. So far, it looks like an exception in human history, rather than the rule. The rule is steady state. So even though you know there was no environmental crisis, I think it's still relevant to ask ourselves the question. 
what do we do with all these institutions that require growth, for example, the welfare state, when that growth is actually slowing down? Maybe we should adapt to this. And the claim that I make in the thesis connected to free growth is that we need to emancipate from a system that is maladapted to the reality of the 21st century, that is very likely, that is already starting to be like this, a century of low or no growth uh, for the global north. Example number two, crisis of social reproduction. So there is this book I love that is titled Who Cooked Adam Smith Dinner? Adam Smith was this Scottish 18th century philosopher slash economist, concert father of economists. And, and the other Who Cooked Adam Smith Dinner is making the, the point that behind the realm visible production, what happens in the factory, what happens here when I'm lecturing, this production of creating a service or a good. There is something that's called reproduction. So in order to be here, I had to be educated, trained, cared for, fed. I had to be supported by friends and family to have the self-confidence in order to do this. All those reproductive factors that are not accounted for in the system of production measured by GDP. So that is the core central foundation of feminist economics, which is one of the schools who use a lot to work on degrowth. But this is an unpaid and priced activity that you lose in the survival of the fittest competition for investments. <coughs> you can imagine that in a capitalist economy, what seems to be free, the unpaid labor, labor at home, and then watching your kids or something like this, is not going to attract investment because it leaves no profit. And so what we see, what feminist economists have studied this, is that these services tend to be marginalized with most of money, and remember, not only the money, but so with the, the time that comes with it, the protection and the security, goes to other activities, actually the activities that we really find more undesirable, banking sector, uh, marketing, extractive activities. What feminist economists show is that those two spheres that are contradictory objects, Production is the sphere of expansion, more and more, that's the sphere of growth. And reproduction is the sphere of the logic of maintenance. You're just making sure that everything's all right, that things can go on as they do. It's more of a qualitative, uh, more of a qualitative concern. And so my point is that even though we would have like infinite resources and everything would be fine and if we go we still be working hard for the first stagnation, it will still be a problem because as you can go the, the production of commodity market commodities increase and increase and increase, we are starving of the reproductive factors that are determinant for that production. So you can see how this growth system is like a snake biting its own tail. And that's the thing that's called the crisis of social production, where at some point, for example, I burn out and leave. Because, you know, I work a week of 40 hours and 50 hours and 60 hours and 70 hours, and then, you know, at some point, I just cannot do it anymore. So, the third example, and I'm going to go super quick through this, is that we, what do we want growth? We want growth, supposedly, for jobs, because it can finance services to public revenues, the welfare state, eradicate poverty, reduce inequality maybe, or just because general well-being provides us with goods and services that makes us happy as individuals. One of the questions I'm testing in the thesis is, is this true? Does economic growth deliver on these promises? And actually, on many aspects it is not. Like the link between GDP and our Unemployment is far from clear. You have countries where they live, like the US, you have countries like Japan, where the link is completely severed. Of course, that depends on the culture. You can imagine during the economic crisis in the US, low labor laws and everything, people get fired. In Japan, no, they spread out and decrease average work hours. Different things. So, inequality. Piketty, Thomas Piketty has shown in his last two books. Uh, that economic growth actually widens the gap between the rich and the poor. So people that argue we want more growth to reduce inequality, that is actually nonsense. It does precisely the opposite. Well-being, it's been shown empirically that after a certain threshold, more money ceases to increase well-being. I don't think I need to show you a billion numbers about this, that sounds 
kind of obvious. At some point, money doesn't buy happiness for some point. So, this is my third point. Uh, even though economic growth was biophysically possible, argue it is not. Even though it was socially sustainable, it is not. Then it would remain undesirable because it fails to achieve what it promises. So, why bother? Basically, why bother? In a world where growth is no longer viable, desirable, the tools of a tool, and all costs are something inadequate and inaccessible, inappropriate, and inadmissible. So, what does Jim Rose say? He says we must, and that's the phrase they use, decolonize our imaginary. And I was going to start to listen to what I talked about autonomy. This is why they call Jim Rose a missile, where I'm a Obu, something that comes and kind of forces us to confront these big questions. What do we want in life? And how we should organize socially without the, the process of division. Choosing, choosing autonomously what we want. That's something I didn't talk about. Testarianist, testarianist is not only proposed two concepts of autonomy. Individual autonomy, that's the one I talked about, and collective autonomy, which is a synonym for direct democracy. I didn't talk about this, but that's the one that is most important when it talks about um, reforming the economy. But of course, he said, we cannot have collective autonomy without individual autonomy. So the first step is, of course, to be able to have individual autonomy. And then when individual, individual autonomous individuals come together, then we can have a real discussion. So the third dimension, remember, that was the first decline in emancipation, degrowth two. And then the latest one that they felt, if you remember the strategy, in other words, okay, we can unbelieve the idea of growth, but then they realize. That's not very sexy, like this against capitalism, consumers and productivism. It doesn't really, it's, it's really an opposition against the system. It doesn't motivate me. But we want to dream. We, we want desires that move us more than fear, maybe. Uh, so they thought, and they thought, I, I'm talking about this, like it's, it's a gladiator strategy, it's like collective, as anarchists, as, get as a movement, so you can see collectively move. Works this like okay, let's try to create our own utopia of life after growth, life after capital, life after neoliberal. And and that that reminds me this this phrase of Antonio Gramsci, which I uh, presented earlier, which I like. Pessimism. He's speaking of pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And as critical scholars, as critical students, I think we need to think about the worst in order to prevent it. And I think we're going to be doing a lot of that soon. As, but we also need to be believing in the best as to move closer to it. Oops, spoiler there, you did not see that. So basically, degrowth is a critique of the growth based economy. When you hear degrowth, don't think of less. Think of a critique of the ideology of growth and the economy that comes with it. But if growthism is a dead end, and if you're convinced about this, you can read my thesis all day long long. The closure of the economy. If growthism is a dead end, what should come to replace it? So now you have the realistic people that will tell you that there are no alternatives. I hear this very often. People just want to tell you that there are no alternatives. Not true. Evidence. Don't trust me. Evidence right there. Right there. And Indiana Jones of alternative economies, that's a story I tell myself. I spent years hunting for the utopias. Look at all of this. This is only in the last century. Every single one of those are people that have criticized the system as it is and imagined a completely different system. Well, some of them are, of course, closer to the system we have. We have the economy of permanence, the first one, Joseph Cornelius Kumarapa, who was the chief economist of Delhi during the independence campaign. And he applied Gandhi's idea of 
uh, Swaraj, Gandhi also had this concept of autonomy. He said, okay, how would an economy based on non-violence and self-institution would look like? And he designed this little model written in a book uh, describing it. Uh, we never hear about the economy of criminals. The economy for the common good. Uh, now this is more recent. You can see it on the right from 2015. This started in Austria with a bunch of businesses that say, well, we don't want to center our activity on the pursuit of financial gains. We actually want businesses to fulfill broader social ecological objectives. Instead of, you know, waiting, they just created an entirely new business framework. Uh, and new indicators of success, and just started to try them and invite them in business to join. The Paracon. So, the Paracon from where it's on the list, Paracon, I'll let you find it, 2003, participatory economy. So, this one is one of the most impressive. I'd say this is the most elaborate alternative to capitalism I've seen. There's been a few books written about it. So, imagine this is an economy that has zero markets. No central planning, no markets whatsoever. That's a design challenge. So one of the findings of my research is that there are plenty of alternatives, and G-Move is only one of them. G-Move is one little line there, no more. So a new dictum for the 21st century should be there is no excuse to not have an alternative. And I should add, there is no excuse to not start working on that alternative now. Some will say that change takes time, or that natura non facit saltus, nature does not make jump. Those of you that don't speak Latin, shame. Maybe nature doesn't make jump, but culture surely does. This is called a revolution. We have done it before, and we need to do it again. Not. In a decade. Not. In a year, not soon, but now, the note is closed. I cannot end the lecture with the word now. This is too cliche. I need to end with something strong, something memorable, and with a bang. Our technique is cool with fire regulation. I'll do a few jokes, maybe. I would do a magic trick to grant I didn't bring my kids. I don't know. Uh, that's not uh, What could it be? It's a good thing. What could it be? Oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. It's the end of the lecture, so you want the goosebumps. You want the thrill. You want to feel your mind dancing, your body tensing, your soul trancing. I understand. I like it too. I want to feel good. I want to go home and tell myself that everything's okay. Chill, relax, unwind, and be well. That's fine. Yeah. Good moment. But let it be clear. Look not to see by and watch what the world burn. We are not going to be realistic. That means adapting to a world that isn't fair. Realism in the good conscience of the ones who exploit and oppress. Of course, they'll tell us that everything is under control. But it is not. They'll tell us to be quiet. We won't. They'll tell us to stay away. We won't this time to be wild and do what we do best. Let our fierce minds dance on the edge of what we think is possible. Let's educate our desires for better and better. Today, the scream loud, fight loud, louder and louder, prevent justice as hard as we may. Not in a decade. Not in a year. But now. Let us dream, yes. Let us do so. Now let it take many lives of us. Because every minute we spend here matters. Every group we meet matters. Every course we have to do matters. Every discussion we have matters.